I'm really honored to be here. One, to be invited to come to Poet's House um, to speak and, and read. And I'm often not invited into spaces like these, so I'm just grateful. And then two, um, to be honored to be, be here to speak about someone I love, who I never got to meet, who inspires every fiber of my being, that everything I do and I believe in is because of June Jordan. And um, I'm just grateful there's a room full of people here who feel like her work is relevant to their lives. And I pray that you support and continue to support her work and share her words uh, with people today because they need them. I'm going to start with um, sharing a little bit about, well, I'm going to read, actually. The review I wrote of June Jordan for Publisher Weekly was actually longer than they allowed to be published. And it wasn't much longer, but the way that sound bites go these days, you got to cut things. So I wanted to give you the full scope of that and then talk a little bit about what using June Jordan's work right now in community organizing and in teaching um, in the community is part of, is part of the, the mission I feel her work needs to be. So defiant black ink marching on the psyche of white pages. June Jordan speaks to us from the eternal front lines of justice. I am black alive and looking back at you. She is forever made anew. Although Jordan is no longer with us in flesh, her words remind us she has never left our side. A tired and trusted comrade, June Jordan is a lover and liberator. She stood against oppression in all, in all of its forms, literary and material, personal and political. This academic reader of Jordan's work spans a lifetime of community witnessing, writing, and doing. It explores her essays, poems, letters, excerpts, comments, and interviews throughout her writing life. As she expands our imagination of language, she equally critiques its limitations. By itself, our language cannot refuse to reflect the agonizing process of alienation. Her revelations came to her through a deep examination of her own interior prison. Jordan wrote for her voice to break free, to hold language accountable and responsible. The reader is a part of her decolonizing method. We are transformed by our collective confrontation of truth-telling. Poetry is a political action undertaken for the sake of information, the faith, the exorcism, and the lyrical invention that telling the truth makes possible. Poetry means taking control of your life, says Jordan. June Jordan makes the case for poetry as a revolutionary act. The creation of poems as a foundation for true community, a fearless democratic society. It is through poetry Jordan begs of us to trust one another and to tell the truth to read the world more closely. By virtue, we become le less reactionary and more precise. Sifting through this reader of Jordan's work, there are moments I wonder whether, the, whether we realize the full grasp and weight of her words selected. June Jordan is the stone hurled from David's sling that knocks down Goliath. Talking back to power is not so much what she does as she addresses the abuse of power itself. Jordan does not merely talk back to power, she acquires it. She uses language to embolden us and to take power where it rightfully belongs, with the people. Throughout her life, Jordan was fully engaged in movement organizing and activism as a poet and essayist. She wrote in the thick of battle. At the foreground of strategy, disagreement, and resolutions, June Jordan was integral in expanding an ideology that we now know to be intersectionality. This reader ought to be required reading for every activist, organizer, person who dares to embark on the journey of self-determination and collective resistance. It occurs to me that much organizational grief could be avoided if people understood that partnership in misery does not necessarily provide partnership for change. When we get the monsters off our backs, all of us may want to run in very different directions. Jordan recognized the only politic that will guide us and ultimately free us must be rooted in radical love. Beyond identity, how are we connected? 
I am saying that the ultimate connection cannot be the enemy. She argued our work must be ruled by an open spiritual orientation and an intellectual humility. It is long overdue that a collection of this kind is made accessible to the public. It can also be argued there is no better time than now. In this country's current political climate, Jordan's words and political analysis are urgent and begs of us that we read more so we may learn the wisdom of those who came before, who resisted before, and loved before. We are not the first to march, to fight, to resist, and write. We have so much to learn from the mistakes of, of those made before us. Jordan laid the foundation. She leaves us the revolutionary blueprint for poetry to transform our lives beyond the white gaze in its literary imagination. Wherever she travels, we are with her. She does not seek isolation and dispels the myth of poetry in solitude. Jordan encouraged writing in community and with people. She wrote on housing development, land reform, gender and state violence, identity politics, economic injustice, international solidarity, poetics, and so much more. It is eerie how relevant her work continues to be. She was well read and therefore well written. Her admiration of Zora Neale Hurston, Phyllis Wheatley, Walt Women, and other key literary figures demonstrates an in-depth appreciation for the power of literary labor. She wrote odes and dedications to our freedom fighters and revolutionaries, celebrated their courage and their love. Her essays do not flatter, though they mirror us. They push us toward deep contemplation and ardent call for risk and action. June Jordan is the community we long for. Her work is the dream of words, the dreams of words to attain a deep understanding of our connection and our power. She wrote of the Miami uprising in 1980 labeled a race riot. Jordan saw a black people's collective resistance to the murder of Arthur McDuffels as a de demonstration of love. Um, it was important to mention this. The reason why I mentioned this was because at the time, um, I also wrote a piece about Baltimore. And I remember when the Baltimore uprisings were happening, also Ferguson, there was um, a need to articulate or, or state that people were somehow um, thugs or you know, you know, just not, or savages and that they didn't know what they were doing. And I constantly tried to pivot the conversation and, and make us focus that though we may be enraged and though we may be angry, it is a direct act of love and a civilized act to resist. And Jordan wrote about this, and when revisiting this reader and seeing that she wrote about this, specifically of Miami, when Miami had literally burned down everything to the ground, and people kept saying, oh, those savages, right? Um, she saw that this was a deep call for love, and that humanity had failed these young black people. So it's just really interesting how relevant that is to the fight now. So. Um, she, she writes, where there is conflict, conscious termination of self-hatred is the only means to rational possibilities for love. Miami was an act of love. Love for Arthur McDuffie and love for every jeopardized black life. As we currently work to bring poetry for the people to community organizers and grassroots leaders in South Florida, and I'll let you know a little bit about that, with the help of Dream Defenders and Community Justice Project, we try to live out her mission, the beloved community. June Jordan guides our resistance and she is an integral part of a canon for black lives. This book is not just a collection of figurative words, it is a tool for liberation. Um, so I wanted to just share a few thoughts just um, after that. I think often about what June Jordan would say about this time, and I worry for words, wishing to have some conversation in life that we never got to have. And then I spend time with her words, and I see her, and I hear her, and uh, she is in us if we dare to listen. I wanted to say that in the book, in the beginning, um, there's an a introduction that's written by Rachel, and she talks about tr this time and, and Trump being a celebrity. But one of the biggest things I, I wanted to acknowledge that I believe June Jordan would acknowledge in this moment is that Trump is not only a celebrity, he's also a real estate developer. 
And it says a lot about where we are in our country right now that we elected a real estate developer to lead the land. Um, it is a joke, a disgrace. He is a symbol of capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy. And he is in the business of taking and redistributing land to those who he believes should have it. And so it's very important that when we talk about this time, we talk about someone who is leading our country that is essentially the epitome, the symbol of colonialism. I think of Black Lives Matter and the disappointment of this phrase, the lack of agency or power in it. In its meaning, I hear June pushing us for stronger words, defiance, courage, something that says, no, we have had enough. I question how we have come from black power to Black Lives Matter. Something is terribly wrong, not just with this country and this nation and white people and white supremacy, but something is terribly wrong deeply in the lives of black people. We are lost. I see the work of the Dream Defenders as integral to this life of solidarity, this need for us as black people here in this country to be connected to the diaspora, to folks oppressed across the globe. And it reminds me of June Jordan, who constantly wrote, not just from the perspective of her identity as a black woman, but also her perspective as a human spirit. All great poets know that language doesn't begin with the word. It begins with the sound, the feeling, the spirit of it. And I wonder how we use our words. Julius Lester, who was good friends uh, with June Jordan, and you could find an interview of, of uh, them speaking online. Um, he also wrote the introduction to one of her po books of poetry. He recently passed away, which was a great loss for our community. He was a great fellow poet and activist, and he once wrote in a book that he actually denounced years later, um, particularly because I think he started getting into children's books and he was like, don't bring up my revolutionary times. But um, he wrote a very powerful statement, which was, representation is therapy, not revolution. I find in this time of teaching how lost young people are, seeking validation and affirmation far more than disruption or new value making. We find ourselves at a time where poetry and poets must interrogate their comfort, their complacency, to embrace and transform a radicalized language. We must seek people power more than ever before. Literary accomplishments and awards will do us no justice and we must know our limitations and who we need to collaborate with for the sake of survival. Words alone cannot change the conditions of our people. We need to get the fuck up out of our rooms and do something about what's going on. I think about where we're organizing right now in Palestine and bringing June Jordan's work with me to Palestine and finding ourselves in a situation where um, we're there to be in solidarity, we're there to, um, to learn, to, to exchange, and yet we still center ourselves. The irony of it all, somehow black folks, we can't get away from the suffering. No matter where we go, it's still within us. And so this means we need to be writing poems because it's the only way we're gonna get free from the narrative that tells us we are not enough. We are not free. The only thing that can decide freedom for you is you. And so we have to do, undo some work, some real work. And I believe June Jordan was using poems to do this work, to question and interrogate what put her into the place of thinking the way that she did, how we were conditioned to value the things that we value. And because of this, we brought Poetry for the People to South Florida. Um, 
I saw a lot of interpersonal conflicts within community organizing. We find that much like everything else, you know, people, it's hard to always agree. So people find themselves in situations where they're arguing over spotlight or funding or um, whose narrative is being told more than someone else's. And it brought me to question, well, we got to do something else. And so we find that every conversation we would be in and organizing, people would be like, you know, I feel some type of way. I feel this, da 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 da, -da. And uh, a side eye or a smirk or an underhand comment would then turn into a disruptive animosity or resentment. And we couldn't get work done. So literally, we're out here trying to change the conditions of our people. We can stand in front of a front line and face a police officer near death, damn near death, but we can't face each other. We can't tell each other what's going on. We can't speak to each other out of love and critique each other out of love and hold each other accountable. And this meant to me that we needed poetry more than ever because poetry deals with the interpersonal relationship. So I started to find a way, how can we get poetry for the people to community organizing? It needs to be in the community. I love academic conversations, but we have to find ways where poetry is not just in a classroom. As much as we can, it needs to be in our, in our living rooms, at the dinner table, um, when we're walking down the street, when we're in the park, we need to be bringing poetry to the people in every possible way because poetry should be a part of the lived experience, not something that is a pastime for folks to be able to do in their desks. And then I'll end um, with this. We started doing this, uh, these salons, um, and it's also not profound because you have to think about the time June Jordan came up. She came up in the time of the black arts movement. A lot of people like to shit on the black arts movement, but you have to realize that the black arts movement was not just about black representation, it was also a politic. It was rooted in a politic of the diaspora and it was rooted in a critique of capitalism and neoliberalism. So in light of that, when you commune with people, it was about how can we get poetry to, to bring us to a place of self-determination, to bring us to a place of dignity, integrity, um, and Amiri Baraka started doing salons in his home. Um, Abi Odun started doing salons in his home. Gwendolyn Brooks, um, you hear about Obasi, you start to learn about folks, the, the Watts uh, workshops in, um, in California. So there was a renaissance going on with poetry. It wasn't just a bunch of individuals. It was, there's so many names we don't even remember from those times. And June Jordan was really important in lifting up not just the idea of writing from uh, political standpoint, but also the practice of using poetry to organize people, to organize people around issues that were integral to our lives and meant survival. So I want to offer that as a, as, a, as a solution and an option for us moving forward. And then I'll end, um, we brought also Poetry for the People to, we're, we're now teaching it in Dade Correctional Facility with a bunch of men this is also the facility where Darren, Darren Rainey, I don't know if you all heard about this, it's one of the deadliest facilities in the country, but um, he was murdered by the guards and he was a mentally ill um, patient there and they literally threw him in a hot shower until all his skin melted off his body. Um, the greatest poets of our generation are locked up behind bars. I can tell you that now. And there's a reason why they're locked up. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm really excited that this book is here and I can't wait to get um, this book in the hands of some of those prisoners because I believe that literature liberates. And thank you for having me. I look forward to the conversation.